Like, did you actually talk to somebody? Yeah. <laughs> yup. <laughs> Who was it? Yes, I did. It was uh, it was the cat from uh, it was the cat from last week's show where we talked to uh, Brian. T- no, it wasn't Brian. Not the seller thief. No, no. But we got we do got new messages from Brian. Nice. Though. Brian ca- Brian called in and told our story. Thanks, Brian. Um, no, dude, it was the guy who the guy who called to talk about the politis theory of boulders and like how boulder oh, fields boulder are field guy. Yeah. 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 He called and because I have our Skype number on my phone, my phone's ringing and I'm sitting in a meeting room at my job by myself. <laughs> and I'm like, huh, this is an unknown number. And sometimes how I just, do you have so much time. It rings once for me. I accidentally like should have answered one today and it still didn't. Go. I don't know. Maybe it's like a setting in the app or something. Mm. Well, anyway, I just said hello. And he was like, <laughs> Oh hey, <laughs> and oh, I was like, shit. I was like, hey, <laughs> I was like, hey, who's this? And he was like, hey man, big fan of the show. And I was like, oh shit, <laughs> I just answered a listener call at my job, and it was cool. He was mad That's cool. Brilliant. He was like talking about. He was like, I was just thinking about this thing, whatever, whatever. We just chatted for a second. I was like. Hey, bro, can you do me a favor and can you call back? (laughs) And I'm going to not answer my phone this time. Uh, And then uh, then you can leave a voicemail. Yeah. uh, It looks like we have four since last week. You want to run through them? You guys, I think what happened was we said the the numbers (laughs) 612-246-4614. And you guys said, cool, we can call that number. And yep. now we're getting like fucking hella voicemails from you guys. So I think we're going to kick off the show every week now. All right, here we go. Playing our messages from you guys. Uh. Okay. Uh. <laughs> okay. Uh. There's like 10 more seconds of this. <laughs> Interesting. Say more about that. Mm. <laughs> okay. Uh, you thanks. know, honestly, that's also part of what the voicemail line is for. If you want to call a dick around, I, we'll probably. I, I guess. That too. We <laughs> don't know, screen these. It no, turns out, so. not even a little bit. Uh, my favorite part about that is if you're playing the one I'm thinking you're playing, or you just played. Uh, whoever called called and left it at like 4:50 in the morning. So, hey man, if you need help, uh, call back. <laughs> <laughs> or like if you were just up drinking until maybe that's the sound that you make when you wake up. That doesn't right mean away. you don't need help. Also, well, <laughs> I'm not saying it does, but those don't. You know, they're not mutually, they're not exclusive. mutually exclusive. That's real. Uh, that yeah. that or like you woke up in the morning because that's kind of how I sound. <laughs> he at tried to turn off his alarm and accidentally called us. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I, hey. I know that feeling. That's also me at 4.50 in the morning if I'm ever awake to see that time of day. Well, uh, let's see what the next one is. Okay. Yo, what's up, guys? Been listening to the show for a while. Really enjoy it. Keep up the good work. Tight. Um, I got a interesting story you guys might want to look into. There's a place out near St. Louis, Missouri called Zombie Road. It's got a pretty interesting story. Um, I've been out to it a couple times. Got some cool stories. Um, check into it. And, um, I don't really have a lot of time to leave a long message. It's Google it and uh, see if you like it. Thanks, guys. Tight. Right, we got we to remind y'all, I know our voice message is fucked up, but y'all got to say, like, at least your first name where you're from so we can make sure yeah. that we shout you out. Or we'll just play your voicemail and you know. Yeah, you'll know. <laughs> no <laughs> you'll know who will. you are. Um, uh, also, if you say the, the line, I have a bunch of cool stories, I mean, maybe you could share one with us. That's I know also I, what it's for, y'all. I know we said you got to keep it under two minutes, but... You don't have to keep it twenty seconds like that, gentlemen. You can you can share a little bit with us. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, if you have many cool stories about a place called Zombie Road, mm-hmm. call back. Leave call back as many times as you need to tell us your Zombie Road stories. Show me what you got. Yes, please show us what you got. All right, we got a couple more. Oh, this person left two. Uh, hopefully, this is the right order in which to play them. Uh, good evening. This is uh, Brian. Yes. Uh, my apologies uh, for the last phone call for not following up. Um, uh, anyway, the uh, one ghost story I have uh, that I have somebody with me when it happened. Um, this has been 20 years ago. Uh, me and a friend, we were out uh, one evening, and uh, it wasn't quite twilight. Uh, we were going down an old country road, and a train was passing through, so we you know pulled up, stopped, and uh, while we're waiting. 
um, this other car pulled up right behind us. And my friend, uh, he looked up and in his rear view mirror, looked in the rear view mirror and said, boy, he got close. And just as I started to look up myself, uh, out of the corner of my eye, it's on the passenger side of the car, I saw this black shape. It was, I mean, it was shaped like a person, but it was just like solid black. Like a, I don't even know how to describe it. And it, I, 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 yeah, I saw it. I looked oh, in the rear view mirror, and, and it was coming behind the car, and something hit the car. So what? me and my friend hop out of the car, and about the time that we do that, and I start to realize what I saw, and I'm thinking, boy, I should have stayed in the car. Well, I went around, but there's nothing there. The 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 the, the ditches to the side um, were were cleaned out, so nobody could have dropped there. There were fields around, so. I mean, there wasn't any timber or anything for them to run into. So it's the back of the car, and there, it was covered in dust and everything, and no smudges, no nothing. So I'm like, boy, that's weird. So I get in the car, sit down, and my friend gets in the car, and I'm like, did you see that? And he's like, yeah, I saw that. And I said, I wonder what that was. And he's like, yeah. He says, what I'm really wondering, though, is the car that pulled up behind us, what happened to it? And I looked up, and the car is gone, and it was a... About, oh gosh, maybe half mile straight shot back the way we came. God damn! All right, I, I'm <laughs> hoping he picks up where he left off on part two. Uh, hi, this is Brian. I apologize. I obviously can't keep my story short. <laughs> no, um, you're good, anyway, Brian. So, do what you gotta day, do. I don't know what it was or what we saw, but uh, that's the ghost story I have with a person that was actually with me. Um, Anyway, uh, I know uh, there was a question about the root cellars. Um, I'll probably just send an email on that one. <laughs> Again, my apologies. Uh, but uh, thank you, guys. I really enjoy your show, and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. Bye. Brian, don't 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 apologize so much, Brian. We like you, Brian. <laughs> You're good, I, man. Your story does sound a lot like that one scene from Close Encounters, though. I'm just saying. It, uh, Don't you wouldn't you wouldn't know it's wouldn't okay. Know. That's you, for the it was you, for the listeners. It wasn't for you. You know I still haven't seen it. <laughs> um, I did watch uh, Ghostbusters the other night. By the way, yeah, yeah, tight. We're we're catching up to the to the eighties finally. <laughs> there we go. Did you enjoy it? That's a good movie. Yeah, it's entertaining. It, it, it's, it's it's funny. It, it holds up. I think. Yeah, in a, mostly in, in a way mostly. that most movies. Don't. Um, that's a that's interesting, Brian. Yeah, we did get Brian's email also, but it's. Real long. So. Okay, we, we pro- <laughs> Brian's. Brian, we're not going to read your email. Brian's not the most concise fellow. That, and you know what, Brian? That's okay. Mm-hmm. You don't got to apologize for that, Brian. <laughs> no more. I'm sorry. You tell us your ghost stories, Brian. All right, we got one more. Uh oh, here we go. Hey guys, uh, love the podcast. It's freaking amazing. So I got something for you. You got to do an episode on. I'm going to butcher the pronunciation of this. Gunjik Kanjima Island in Japan. It is a totally abandoned ghost town. I left the link in the podcast group. Check it out. I think you'll definitely be fascinated by it. Also, I got personal ghost stories. There's a ghost living in my parents' basement, and it has interrupted me on multiple occasions of making out down there when I was a teenager. So okay. that's a good story, too. If you ever want to ask me about it or let me talk about it. Guys, great job on the podcast. And good. Gunja Kimjima Island. There's a link in the What If group. Uh, thanks. Keep doing it. Hell yeah. That ghost was just your mom, though, bro. <laughs> she she had like a... Ooh, knock it off! <laughs> you should be more modest! <laughs> oh, shit. We gotta go! <laughs> Put your clothes back on. God damn. Ghost mom. Yeah, that... <laughs> How many how many girls <laughs> did you ever make out with in your parents' basement have a ghost experience and they ever came back to your house? That was just your mom scaring off your potential suitors being like, hey, not my son. I like it. It's my, creative. My son's better than <laughs> better than her. I'm, I'm gonna go put the sheet on and start howling. <laughs> rat, get my rattling chains. <laughs> Honey, get the rattling chains. We gotta scare some <laughs> some dirty tramp out of the basement again. Jesus, bro, it's aggressive. <laughs> well, that's what she's trying to do. She's trying I'm to scare her off. Watch your language. I, Jeez, come on, it's a family podcast. Dirty, <laughs> dirty tramp. I could have used so many more words. Don't say it again. Dirty tramp. Say it My, three times. Uh, speaking of, I gotta tell one more quick story about uh, 
about Brian because we got a really hilarious tweet at uh, at the Twitter account this week too. That's where the tweets go. <laughs> That's the, I tweeted our Twitter account uh, at What If Pod from I think it was Brian's wife actually who mm. uh, shared that Brian's son. The one who yells comes oh, running from across the house and yells things like "Get in my belly!" at his dad because of the sweary boys. Uh, she took a picture of the kid and was like, "This is the one who." Uh, You're welcome, and we apologize. <laughs> um, man, while we're shouting out people from social, I gotta do one more shout out uh, to, and I'm pulling the name up right now. But uh, speaking of the sweary boys. Uh, the sweary boys were, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Immortalized in cartoon form. Oh yeah. That was brilliant. Uh, this past week. Uh, in, if you're, if you're not in the group, if you just go to facebook.com, uh, slash groups slash what if podcast or, uh, we'll add you, you can just search for the what if podcast in, in, uh, in Facebook. Uh, she posted a link to this thing here, but it's, one of our listeners is an illustrator and put the fucking coolest thing I've ever seen. Uh, some listener art of me and Spencer as the sweary boys. And uh, her name is uh, Shelby Celine Bunjavac, I think is how it's pronounced, but I'm sorry if I, if I fucked that up, Shelby. Um, but also, Shelby, can you send us at hi at whatifpodcast.com like a full res version of that so we can oh, yeah. turn it into a poster and put it up in the studio or like potentially use it and keep shouting you out? Uh, Shelby is very dope and her Instagram account is very dope and uh, and has a bunch of cool illustrations. So fuck yeah. Thank you to all of you for being cool as fuck. Oh, dang. Hell yeah. Want to talk about some weird shit? I suppose it's time to talk about some weird shit. Did you see any weird shit in Colorado? Um, I did actually. I have a I have a photo I need to post on uh, <laughs> on, what? on the Instagram account. Well, it was so it was an abandoned shack that we came upon in the middle of the woods. Ghost shack, uh, kind of ghost shack, but mostly had a bunch of really uh, outrageous alien graffiti all over it. It Ooh. had like. Uh, it had like alien heads and mm-hmm. like fucking flying saucers drawn inside of the shack and shit. Nice. We biked by it and I was like, oh dang. <laughs> this, <laughs> oh dang. <laughs> this is a weird thing to just stumble upon. Hell yeah. Um, but y'all also have to see me in bike shorts because that's a real mm. thing that happened. Uh, did uh, did you take the picture with your selfie stick? I did not. Mm. I did not. My Because uh, my... then you could have gotten your bike shorts in the picture. Yeah, in full in their full glory. Mm-hmm. No, my uh, mm-hmm. my significant other uh, took the the photo, so mm. I, I did not need. Is that what we're calling the selfie stick these days? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's my best friend, dude. My selfie stick is my best friend. Do it. Do a photo series of you like holding the selfie stick out in front of you, like the you know, like the girlfriend hand thing, <laughs> pulling me pulling yeah. me across the yeah. world. Yeah, that's actually a really good idea. Somebody You're should welcome. do that. <laughs> Should be you. It should have been you like a week ago. I'm gonna start doing that on the what if account. <laughs> <laughs> just every once in a while. I'll be like in the grocery store and I'll just like hold up the we'll, selfie we'll, stick. We'll hashtag Ryan stick. Mm, let's not do that <laughs> no? at all. No. I think that's, but it's, a, I think that's accurate. It's it's I, you and I, your stick. I mm, I mm, mm. Mm, I don't think. Okay. No one needs that. Well, we'll workshop the the hashtag. Okay. All right. Fair. (laughs) You guys can figure out the hashtag for us. You ready for some Amstrin Rico? Um. Yeah, I am. But I'm also ready for some battery. Can I? Can I steal the juice? Oh yeah. I got the juice. Need some juice for the lappy? I do. I do. Whatever. Whatever happened to Home Star Runner? Oh man. Strong bad. Email. (laughs) Need some juice for the lappy so you can check into email. Do we just <laughs> do we just date ourselves? There's probably a plenty of people in I'm here. Sure, who we are have like, a bunch of times. What in the hell is a home star? Runner? Well, Google it and see you in a couple weeks. Is it still a a website that can be a website? I feel like we've probably done this on the show before. No, we haven't. Have we referenced Homestar on the show before? I I don't know. Maybe I just yeah, HomestarRunner.com still oh, going strong. Thank God. Are they making? No, they're not making more videos. YouTube channel. Okay. Mm-hmm. Most recent video posted. Uh, please hold. Please hold. One month ago. No fucking way. Mm-hmm. Although I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't think these are necessarily new. I think they're just uploading all the old videos to the to a YouTube channel. 
I mean, I think I'm still down. I'm still here for it. You know, I tell you what, I'll watch all 111 of them this week and get back to you. <laughs> Let you know if there are any new ones. Fantastic. I don't we'll, have anything to do. And we'll pull a handful of sound drops. Oh. From Homestar. Oh, shout out to the dude who sent us a bunch of uh, Boondock sounders, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. Do we I didn't load any of them up because I'm, you know, jobs and stuff, but uh, we'll get to it. Do we Do we know that person's name that we're shouting out? <laughs> You know, the guy these, these who sent us. These anonymous shout are. Well, I think he specifically said don't say his name. Oh, so the guy yeah, who yeah. sent us nope, the, right. the stuff. You're right. <laughs> Thanks for the drugs. You're right. That person did specifically say, can you not reference me? Yeah. So, oops. Thanks, Sorry, guy. guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We haven't talked about cults in a really long time on this show. Yeah, we, uh, we did... One full episode all about cults. Like a year and a half ago now. It wasn't that long, was it? Oh, that was that was a single digit First, episode, I think. What? I think it was like episode nine or something. God damn. <laughs> you know what? I I haven't done I haven't listened to any of our very first episodes. I wouldn't worry about it. I I mean I Face your fears, son. <laughs> I am a little bit nervous. I'll be honest. I'm a little nervous to go back and uh, and figure out what those look slash sound like. But, but you know what? Fuck with me, I'm grown now. Yeah. <laughs> the first ones were a little rough, but Fuck with me, I'm grown now. I think we figured it out. What up, Shmuel? Uh, yeah, we're going to talk about Om Shinriko. Sh- mm. Mm. I got close. You did get close. Om Shinrikyo? Yeah. Shinrikyo. Yes. Om Shinrikyo. The KY thing is... Mm. Yeah, you got to hit Phrasing. the K sound mm. in the... Mm. <laughs> Having mm. a hard time tonight. Dun, 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 dun. Heck. <laughs> <laughs> Not having that hard of a late. time. You, no, but it was, it was... It's been a long day, okay? It's almost okay. It's almost better if it's a half second late. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Heck. <laughs> <laughs> it's trying. Oh, it's boy. trying. Um, yeah. A cult formed in Japan. Yeah. Most famously known for the Tokyo subway attacks of 1995. Yeah, should we do you want to tell well, like can, the whole history of the cults? We should give a quick overview. Do you you want to cover that part? I yeah, I I mean I think so. I think okay. it's probably uh Yeah, it, it's definitely worth it. It's it's worth it and also I think like we're 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 kind of burying the lead right now, but I think it's it's worth learning kind of some of the depth of the history of the cult to get to the uh, the the lead that we are in fact burying at this time. Show me what you got. So, um, in 1955, Chizuo Matsumoto was born, uh, who later changed his name to Shoko. Asahara. That's the worst name I ever heard. Shots fired. <laughs> Shots <laughs> fired. Um, so Asahara was born in uh, Japan and actually suffered from infantile glaucoma. So he was... Um, oh, I didn't know that was even possible. I didn't either, um, but was basically fully blind in one eye very shortly after birth. And uh, mostly blind in his right eye by a very young age. So actually attended a school for the blind. It was almost fully blind. I feel uh, a little bit bad for making fun of his name now. Well, you won't. Okay, cool. <laughs> you Keep won't. Going. We'll we'll make fun of him for much uh, much worse reasons. Great. By the way, hey, we don't always like we try to stay away from mostly dark stuff. This one is like eh, dabbles in that world. Yeah, it's about as close as we'll get to yeah. depressing shit. We try not to do overtly depressing things. This one, these, but we'll just say this: these guys were people died. These, these guys were shitheads, and people they were died. fucking stupid, and they made a bunch of fucking shitty choices, and they killed some people. And we'll tell you about that now. <laughs> Yay. But that's not the point of the episode. I think our 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 mo is we avoid it if the like the point of the story is, and then people died. This is not the point of that story. Mm, yes, close. And and yes, and. All right. Anyway, there's a little blind kid. Yeah, and uh, and his name became Shoko Asahara. Uh, he's he's blind. He he marries father's twelve children. Mm-hmm. Okay, big fam. Uh, and starts doing acupuncture as a profession. Uh, uh mm, what? Blind ac- acupuncturist? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I wouldn't, but. <laughs> Yeah. Maybe, 
maybe your aim you you go by feel better. Uh, hmm? Like maybe you, maybe you trust your instincts better because <laughs> you because you because it's all you got. Sure, whatever. I don't know. It didn't work out though, right? Uh. No, because in 81, Asahara was uh, convicted of, uh, quote, practicing pharmacy without a license, which I'm mm. pretty sure we call here in the United States drug dealing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I like I like practicing without a license better. I, I do, too. It's a very, I'm an unlicensed pharmacist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like, I feel like that, like... I've got pretty limited stock. I mostly carry one thing. Right. <laughs> If you were to go into a job interview and they're like, uh, yeah, you got a felony. Uh, can you tell me what that's about? Uh, I was selling Coke. Like, that doesn't work very well. If they're like, uh, you know yeah, what? you have a felony here. Well, I was practicing pharmacy without a license. <laughs> they're like, oh, well, I, I mean, I can see how that could happen. You know, you're yeah, fine. Yeah, my uh, my license lapsed. I didn't know. Uh, n- no, no, no. You, you can't have a license to sell what I was selling. But yes, I was also an unlicensed pharmacist. Um. So, so I, I say that to say that dude was not, um, not exactly on the straight and narrow for sure most sure. of his adult life. Um, so around that time, uh, as penalty for his quote practicing pharmacy without a license, uh, he was fined two hundred thousand yen, which is about two grand, which is not a ton, a ton of money, but it's a lot of money, and if you don't. Not if you're not if you're selling drugs. Well, also true. That's like one good day. <laughs> it's a pretty, I've heard <laughs> it's a pretty good, pretty good ratio there. Yeah. Um, Every couple of weeks, I pay a fine and I keep making my money. But also, if you got to feed twelve kids, you probably need a little more money. Well, and as we've talked, better about, start a cult. <laughs> as we've talked about in the world of cults, uh, sometimes people have better hope. claim your Jesus. <laughs> Oh shit! I'm fucking poor. Hey, uh, guys, quick update. <laughs> turns <I'm> out, <laughs> turns out, all this time, who knew? Because the first thing Jesus would do if he came back would be to ask people for money. <laughs> oh man, you guys are really fucking this planet up. Look, I'm gonna need a couple bucks here. <laughs> I know I can turn anything into anything and eat it and stuff, but I'm gonna need some money first. Give me your shit. <laughs> I need to extort a couple people uh, along the way. Yeah. Uh-huh. Which, uh, spoiler alert, turns out that's exactly uh, what Shoko Asahara did. So um, he... Also, spoiler, not God. <laughs> also, spoiler, not God, nope. in, in case you hadn't already figured that out. Um, so what Asahara did was he, he took principles from almost every religion you've heard of, Uh, early Indian Buddhism, uh, later stage Tibetan Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity. Wait, which one, which one of those religions says lie to people for money? (laughs) Um, yeah, no, not, not in that way. I I think it was, um, which, which one says, uh, kill transit passengers? Well, actually an, an interesting element of, well, I bet it's not Buddhism. Well, Actually, <laughs> huh, I missed that part. I guess I'll I'll get to that. Well, I'll get to that later. But uh, essentially, what he did was he started a meditative yoga class that started recruiting people, and a bunch of the stuff that they talked about and sort of preached in their meditative yoga classes pulled uh, different religious ideas from all of these different, you know, types of religions. You ever talk to somebody who just started doing yoga? Because it does feel like they're trying to get you to join a cult. Oh yeah. Dude, you got to come. You're going to feel so much better. You're going to see it. You're going to get it. Um, so, I, yeah, so in starting this, this class, basically over time, Asahara gets a bigger following to the point where he needs to expand into a larger space mm-hmm. uh, and starts to preach to his followers that they need to give up their worldly possessions to him. Classic. To him. Uh, Classic cult leader move. <laughs> Classic cult leader move. Um, yeah, he, he needed to he, he needed to have those things so that they could fully focus on 
uh, their their meditation. Right. I'll bear the burden of, of all of your money. Yes, <laughs> you guys go stretch. I know this is I know this is really stretch for Jesus weighing on your mind. So I'll take it. Don't worry. Um, so Asahara starts, and actually, I guess you can you can formally petition to have a recognized religious group in Japan. Oh yeah, which they did, and and started um Shin Rikyo. Um, the, the cult itself was this, this group of people that swelled to numbers of close to 2000 people, they say at its max. And they think that that's only in Japan. Outside of that, there were sects that broke off into other, uh, locations, including apparently for a period of time in the United States as well. Oh dude, it was, it was way, way more people than that though. Yeah. I think the Japanese numbers were 2000. Okay. Okay. No, more than that in Japan. That was I, the number I found. I think it was like in the tens of thousands. But that and isn't that the total number spread out into all of the locations? No. Oh, at, dang. at one point they had an estimated thirty to thousand, thirty to fifty thousand members in Russia. But wasn't that the one, the thing I read said that that was that is from the mouths of Om Shinrikyo? Mm, like those are self-reported, weren't they? I was reading that from the Federation of. American Scientists article. Which is a trip, y'all. Yes. If you want to really go into the fucking nittiest of nitty gritty, there's like a, I don't know, it's got to be close to like 30,000 words. It's huge. Uh, it's a lot. It took me like an hour to read it. Yeah, it's like twenty to 30,000 words. And it's uh, it's the, yeah, the Federation of American Scientists wrote a full report on Am Shinrikyo's like power and... It was basically, this group is a threat to not just the United States, but the world, and here is why. And one of their biggest arguments was because they had so many members spread out so far around the world. They were in Japan, U.S., Russia, various parts of Asia, and former USSR. Yes. And they were in at least seven countries and on four different continents, and at one point had a budget of roughly a billion dollars. Yeah, which was crazy. I saw something that said In they, 1997, so like a billion and a half-ish now. Yeah. yeah. I saw something that said... Uh, just like in Tokyo alone, they had 16 separate buildings that were in their own name. They had multiple front corporations and front businesses to A, bring in income, but B, like have ways of cooking books and keeping people off the trail of their uh, more or less less legal activities, I guess. Yeah. Even less legal than money laundering. Yes, yes. Um, but yeah, it was it was tens of thousands of members worldwide, if word. not uh, maybe up to a hundred thousand at one point. And like, fucking doing doing all kinds of bad shit left and right, including yes, breaking into the Tokyo Police Department offices and trying to scrub computers for driver's license information of members. Yep. Um, they were just like straight up robbing places for uh like uh chemicals and machines and tools um like they, they fucking, bought a russian helicopter at one point and smuggled it into japan sure did like what mm -hmm. I, I don't understand you gotta you gotta be able to pull some fucking strings to buy a russian military helicopter and fucking just get it across a border yeah i mean the, the amount or, of, or just have crazy amounts of money. Or just have crazy amounts of money. Or, you know, why not both? Yeah. Um, they were they were most interested in, or by the mid-90s, most interested in manufacturing chemical weapons. Yeah. Which is what they're best known for in that 1995 Tokyo subway attack. Yeah. In which they released, uh, is it pronounced sarin? Sarin, yes. Sarin. sarin. I think I've sarin? heard okay. both. Uh, a nerve agent on five trains in Tokyo subway system that killed 13 people, injured 54, and affected any 1,000 up to 10,000, depending on where you read about it. It can make you go blind, which is, um, I don't mean this as a joke at all, kind of ironic, and it actually made me wonder if there was any connection between Asahara's mm. blindness and his desire to like blind other people. That's pretty fucked up. Yep. I mean, um, so is killing people, obviously, but... Right. Well, and to go back to the thing that I referenced earlier, um, this American psychologist, uh, Robert J. Lifton, did some writing on 
uh, Aum Shinrikyo. And uh, there's this interesting quote. He said he believed that, uh, quote, Aum interpreted the Tibetan Buddhist concept of Pawa in order to claim that by killing someone contrary to the group's aims, they were preventing them from accumulating bad karma and thus saving them. Yikes. So they had essentially created this dynamic where they so believed in their, they, they're, they're a doomsday cult in the way that they thought they were essentially responsible for bringing destruction or, or inciting destruction to the world. They thought, they that thought Armageddon, the world was ending in 97. Yeah. And that it was going to be caused by a nuclear Armageddon began by the United States. Right. And they thought that they were, um, a, a tool of God to incite that into being. And because of that, they Clifton or excuse me, Lifton points out that he thinks that they had essentially tricked themselves into believing that anyone who got in the way of them trying to incite this Armageddon, which would bring on a higher spiritual plane, that by killing them, they were actually doing them a favor. Hmm. Gotta say, I disagree with that logic. <laughs> me too. <laughs> Pretty, I don't pretty think that really holds up. Pretty shitty idea, yeah. guys. Yeah. Um. So. So yeah. So in uh, in 1995, you you talked about they they did this sarin attack a couple years before in 1993. They had actually killed a member of the cult who tried to uh, tried to leave it with a different uh, nerve agent gas that they were also proactively trying to create uh, in their gobs of homes and buildings and with all their gobs of money. A few people who spoke out like publicly against the cult disappeared or ended up dead. Yeah. The, they, they were very into, into killing people in the mid nineties. Yeah. Uh, what was the name of the, the family? The Sakamoto family uh, was uh, another, another set of murders caused by um, Shinrikyo. The, the father of the family was uh, Tsutsumi. I think it's Tsutsumi Sakamoto, who was a lawyer. Um, or no, sorry, he wasn't in the cult. He was working on a on a lawsuit against the cult. Mm-hmm. So he was known for anti cult laws in uh, in Japan, and he was going to start a class action lawsuit against them, being like they're not a religion, they're a cult, mm-hmm. and we should treat them as such. Um, and basically, with all the it's the same as in the U S right? Like religions get tax breaks on buildings and income and all that shit. And if it was a class action lawsuit that found them out to be a cult, there would be retroactive penalties and all kinds of shit. So they'd have to surrender all this stuff. Well, fucking, uh, he, he, his wife and his child were all murdered by people who broke into their apartment. Mm. And, uh, six years after they were murdered in 1989, uh, it was found that um, Shinrikyo was, in fact, responsible for said murders. They were into some pretty gnarly shit. Yeah. After the 95 subway attack, they uh, their like headquarters was raided by Japanese police, and they found <laughs> explosives, chemical yeah. weapons, a Russian MI-17 military helicopter. Which, in their office? Well, I think office is probably uh, an understatement. Yeah, a building of some kind yeah. with storage, I'm sure. There were reports that don't appear to have been substantiated, however, of uh, anthrax and Ebola cultures being found. Whoa! Uh, stockpiles of chemicals that could be used for producing enough sarin to kill 4 million people. Parts of AK-47 rifles. They were trying to manufacture automatic weapons. They also found several people being held captive in, like, jail cells that they had built. So, they were into some pretty nasty shit. They also apparently had, uh, like, medical offices or, like, what were considered hospitals. And they would uh, extort members by basically treating them in their own medical facilities and then charging them exorbitant hospital bills and forcing them to pay with threats of violence. 
Sounds not that different from how we do medical care in the U.S., but... You know, you're right. <laughs> when you put it like that. Um, one of the weirdest things that was found out after they attacked people in Tokyo subways in 95... Yes. ...was that one place where they had a presence outside of Japan was Australia. Yeah, and... Uh, Really quickly before we hop to Australia, I just want to say that Asahara was arrested in 95 after the subway attack and is still in jail to this day. However, the cult sort of survived and sort of still exists now. Yes. Although it's split and is in like two different groups. Yes. Um, that are like just barely being allowed to exist in Japan as of 2017, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But obviously they don't have nearly the uh, the prowess that they once did when they had billions of dollars and tens of thousands of members. No, completely. Or and Asahara was, was sentenced to hanging and apparently has not hung yet because th- the way that I read it, it made it sound like he's potentially continuing to like rat people out or mm. something like that. Like they... He's still useful in an informational find, sense. Yeah, they've continued to find members of um, Shinrikyo and people who participated in some of these murders and stuff like that. So he's... Yeah, there were, what, a total of like 13 people arrested in, for the 95 attack? I think that's right. Yeah. So, as of 93, they had a presence in Australia and purchased a place. Ryan is laughing already. I'm not sure what about. Carry on. I, never mind. They had purchased some property in Australia called ba- Banjawarn. Is that what we're going with? I I was gonna go to with Banjawarn, but uh, Bajoran, <laughs> Bajoran, but Banjawarn Station. Banjawarn, Banjawarn, ba- yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. Um, it was what five hundred thousand acres. It was huge, big as fuck, out in the middle of nowhere, Australia. Also. I think that calling uh, calling a farm a station is like the cutest thing Australia has done in a really long time. Yeah, I guess farm isn't exactly right either. It's just a big-ass plot of land with a few sheep on it, it sounded like. Yeah. And a building or two. Uh, but when pr- police raided the station in 1994, or when police raided the station after the 95 attack, um, they found a hidden laboratory... An abandoned house, many computers, beakers, tubing, Bunsen burners, all kinds of like scientific shit, mm-hmm. multiple generators, chemicals, and 29 sheep carcasses, yeah. leading them to believe that the group had been testing the nerve agents they were developing in the middle of the Australian outback on some poor, miserable sheep. That lived in Banjuan Station. Or... In some cases, did not live. Or did not live. What makes this story extra weird is that on May 28th of 1993, there was a mysterious seismic disturbance detected coming from the general vicinity of Bonjour Station. That was, quote, 170 times more powerful than the largest explosion known in Australia up to that time. In a in, from like a, a a mining explosion because there's a lot of mining that sorry a lot of mining that happens in this area for gold and other minerals. Mining explosions happen from time to time. Originally, they thought, well, this was probably a mining explosion, except that it was 170 times stronger than what had been the previously strongest recorded mining S- explosion. Was it just mining explosion, or the or stronger than any seismic event in Australia up to that point? Uh. I saw it written that way, but I think that's incorrect because okay. it was measured on uh, the Richter scale as like a three something. So it was strong enough to show up on like whatever seismic monitoring systems were around at the time. Yeah. But obviously a, a three, it was like a three six or something on the Richter scale, which okay. would not have been, I can't imagine 170 times stronger than the strongest seismic event on the continent. I suppose that that's seems true, impossible. unless they have none, but... Yeah, I, I, I think that that's meant to read as the 170 times stronger than the strongest mining explosion recorded. Got it. Um, 
yeah, magnitude 3.6 on Richter scale, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. At first, the assumption was, well, if it's not a mining explosion, it was probably a small earthquake. However, there were many reports in the area of a great explosion and a huge flash of light at the same time as this uh, explosion or Seism earthquake seismic or event. whatever. So an earthquake does not come along with huge flashes of light in the sky and explosions that are visible. Seen by long road truckers in the Australian outback. For like hundreds of kilometers around. Yes. And what many people described as looking like a meteor, but we'll get to the descriptions in a minute. This all came to light because of a... A 90, 1997 New York Times article, uh, which reported the, or cataloged some of the reports of the uh, explosions and flashes of light and the uh, the research that was done into, uh, is it IRIS? Uh, yeah, or IRIS. IRIS, which is, uh, shit, what does that stand for? Uh, Whatever. The group that looks into seismic events. So there's a 1997 New York Times article that pulled some of this information just saying, like, this is kind of weird. It didn't seem to be an explosion. It didn't seem to be a meteor. It didn't seem to be an earthquake. What was going on here? Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology. There we go. Um, because there were reports that sounded a lot, a lot like a meteor. People reported seeing a red fireball in the sky, uh, moving across the sky, um, a huge, like, blinding flash of light, which could be, if you remember uh, a couple of years ago now, there was that huge meteor that broke up over Russia. Yeah, and like... And a lot of people captured it on dash cams or security footage or whatever. Yep. And it's like so bright that it completely whites out the cameras that were on it and it looks like the fucking sun is falling to the earth. It's, it's insanely bright. It takes up the whole sky. However... There was no impact crater. Yeah, they searched the area for one of those. So if it was a meteor, it didn't make contact with the ground, which happens sometimes. Like in the case of that Russian meteor, the reason it was so bright is because it broke up and burned up in the atmosphere. But if it didn't hit the ground... It wouldn't have had a seismic effect. Right. You wouldn't have had a 3.6 Richter, Richter scale earthquake measured. Yes. So then the speculation became, well, was it a crazy coincidence where there was this earthquake and a meteor at the exact same time? Both very rare, like once a decade type events happened simultaneously. And that's what people are reporting. Yep. And it just also happened to be in the, in the area that this cult was operating. Uh, a gentleman named... Um, what was the dude's name? The guy who wrote the uh, the original paper suggesting that they were building nukes out in the desert. Um, <laughs> you're talking about uh, the original paper? Yeah, Harry Harry Mason. Oh, yeah. A dude named Harry Mason in 90, 1997, after this New York Times article came out, uh, started doing research into these reports of the fireball and the earthquake and gather and he started gathering eyewitness reports. Uh, one of whom said he saw a UFO, by the way, just so that we're consistent. Aliens! <laughs> uh, one gentleman said he saw a fairly slow moving UFO and became worried that they were going to land and abduct him and his two companions since it flew directly at him and then passed very noisily low overhead. Hmm. So he hid overnight until it went away. Um, Which, you know. Yeah. But he, he gathered reports uh, saying that there was this huge thing moving across the sky. It was not, it, it didn't appear to be dropping any like pieces or breaking up. Mm -hmm. So if it were a meteor similar to the one seen in Russia a couple of years ago, you would see pieces of it breaking off as it broke up and burned up in the atmosphere. That was not re reported. Right. People reported feeling a huge shock wave from some sort of impact or explosion or something that was strong enough to rattle things off of tables and like 
a couple of people reported, you know, I was crouching down in my garden and I fell over because the ground was shaking so much. And like, it seemed like a pretty significant event. Yep. Um, some people reported seeing this light or explosion or fire or whatever, this burning ball of something hovering off the ground for up to two hours before eventually just going out. So they could see after they heard this explosion off in the distance, a fireball like miles away hovering in the air for two hours before it just sort of turned off. Is what they told Harry Mason. Sounds a little bit like a mushroom cloud. So Mason comes to the conclusion after interviewing people, he flew a little prop plane around the outback, going to all these various sites, uh, looking for an impact crater. So he puts together, people report seeing a giant fireball. Mm -hmm. There was clearly an explosion of some kind. It Mm -hmm. was measured by seismologists in the area. It was reported by tons of eyewitnesses. There's no impact crater. Nope. There's a cult in the area who, as we'll get to, was up to some even shadier shit than we alluded to earlier. Yep. He comes to the conclusion that they managed to build and successfully test a nuclear weapon in the Australian outback in 1994-ish. Which I have a slight qualm with, but keep going. Not not a qualm with uh, with the assessment. I have I have a qualm with how. Okay. So Mason's report is not taken very seriously. Yeah. Uh, he did sort of a, a PR press tour. Seemed to be calling a lot of attention to himself. Seemed to maybe have some ulterior motives for yes. self, in terms of self promotion, uh, appearance fees, book sales, the usual shit. Yep. And I was ready to write this off as like, yeah, weird, you know, very rare, but happens natural event out in the middle of nowhere. You have only a few witnesses. This dude exaggerates a few of the reports. It's not clear that he ever, like all these reports were anonymous. So none of them can be confirmed by anyone else. Yep. This dude saw an opportunity to make up a good story and promote himself. And then I found that FAS article Mm -hmm. where they talk about some of the things that Am Shinrikyo was up to. Uh Uh-huh. And it becomes more and more apparent that they were definitely trying to acquire and or build nuclear weapons. Yep. And that they most definitely owned property out in the middle of the Australian outback. Yep. Some of the things documented in this FAS report include that in August of 93, the cult attempted to obtain a Mark IV XP interforometer from the Zygo Corporation in Connecticut. It is a laser laser measuring system used primarily for measuring lens systems or optical components. However, one of its main uses today or at the time and by the military at the time was measuring plutonium. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to purchase an extremely expensive, like six figure piece of equipment used to measure plutonium with lasers. Yep. Um, It's an item that was, at the time, prohibited from being exported to certain countries, including Libya, Iran, North Korea, and Cuba. Oh, gee, I wonder why. (laughs) Oh. Um, It's almost as if it would be fucking really dangerous. They had agreed to pay $102,000 for it. Mm Mm-hmm. In order to purchase the property in Australia, they formed two front companies. Yes. Because the uh, previous property owners were suspicious of a group showing up with $400,000 in cash and saying, yes, we'd like your property, please. Give me your 1,500 acres of land. And um, so they formed two different front companies, one called Clarity Investments and another called the Maha Posia Australia Limited mm-hmm. in May and June of 93. You know when you're limited, you're, you're legit. Very exclusive. Very exclusive. 
very exclusive terrorist organization. Right. When they form these companies uh, on their articles of formation or whatever paperwork they had to file, the intended purpose stated for these companies was mining and exploration. They purchased eight mining leases under those same front companies for the Banja Banjawarn Station property. For uh, roughly $40,000. They were spending is, money fucking hand over fist for whatever they were doing. My, uh, my favorite is the group that traveled to Banjawarn and the list of things they tried to bring into the country. Yes. Can I, can I read this Please. really quick? So, uh, basically, as far as I understand, a gentleman named Hayakawa was sort of sussed out to be the leader of the Banjuwarn Station project. He's was he the uh, like the construction or facilities dude? Is this yeah, the same Hideki, dude that was in Russia like every other week? Yes, Hideki okay. ba- Hideki or Hideki? I think that's his name. Are you t- uh, Hayakawa? Is that his last name, right? Yeah, Hayakawa. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce his first name. Ki- Kyo Kyo Hide K I Y O H I D E. That's my Japanese sucks. Yeah, I, know. I know mine too. I'm sorry, guys. Um, but yeah, so Hayakawa, uh, <laughs> Hayakawa and Hideo Murai, the the group's science and technology minister. Which, by the way, there's a whole fucking thing in here about how. They kind of like formatted their group like a government. and It's like a weird military government sort of hybrid. And in some ways, it seemed like maybe they were trying to overthrow the Japanese government and mm-hmm. replace it with themselves. Like they were almost starting a structure so that it could replace an existing structure. Were they able to hey man, if succeed you have a, in if their you goals? Have a billion dollars and a nuke and a helicopter, you're ahead of some countries. Yeah, yes, you are. <laughs> in fact, you're you're up there over more than a few countries. Mm-hmm. Um, when when these two guys came together, uh, along with Nimi Tomomitsu, who was the home affairs and their home affairs minister, again, like trying to create real cabinet positions, basically cabinet positions. Uh, they, they tried to ship a bunch of shit into Australia to go to Banjawaran station. They traveled with, I'm going to actually just read a quote from the paper. Cause it's great. This list is disturbing at best. The Alm group traveled with chemicals and mining equipment on which they paid over $20,000 in excess baggage fees. According to the Australian Federal Police report, among the baggage was... I like that they didn't say, no, you can't bring these chemicals and your helicopter <laughs> with. You just have to just give us a little extra money. Yeah, uh, we're going to need at least 20 grand. Oh, okay, sure, we have a billion dollars. <laughs> That's We literally wipe our asses with that amount of money. According to the Australian Federal Police report, among the baggage was a mechanical ditch digger, picks, petrol generators, gas masks, respirators... And shovels, a customs duty. Because you can't just buy some shovels when you get there, right? Like, make sure you ship the shovels, guys. A customs duty of over fifteen thousand additional dollars was paid to import these items, and because of the large amount of excess excess baggage being brought in by the group, Australian Customs searched the entire group. The search revealed four liters of concentrated hydrochloric acid, Seems including like too much, including some in containers marked as hand soap. Clever. Among the other chemicals... Hey, hey, why do you have four gallons of hand soap? It's real dirty. Gonna get... It's, it's Australia. It gets Dave, real dirty. Dave, it's just hand soap, man. <laughs> Speaking of which, we've been, di- we've been moving around these ditch diggers. I want to wash my hands real quick. Oh, they're gone. Dave, my hands are gone. Dave, I don't have hands. Oh, dang. They also found ammonium chloride, sodium sulfate, perchloric acid, and ammonium water. Oh, 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 I'm going to do it. Yep, you sure are. <laughs> what? Okay. Can mm-hmm. you not get those things in Australia? Like, I, I know I know we didn't really have air, airport security in the way that we do today. <laughs> in, and like they the mostly 90s. got away with this aside from paying some fines. Well, sort of. A couple people got arrested. Yeah, but I mean, what's a couple people when you got 50,000? That's true. They were killing people all the time anyway. They didn't give a fuck. The thing that I don't understand about this, Dave, to Dave, your point... Hold, hold this soap for a while. Bring the No, just walk this soap to the other side of that line over there. Let us, let us know how it goes. The, the other thing that I don't understand is, to your point, like, 
if people are transporting hydrochloric acid in soap containers, how do you not go like, uh, okay, we need all of that stuff and you need to get the fuck out of our country. They're like, hey. Right. No, they still let them in. Give us the acid. Take your ditch digger and Give us go 20 home. grand. Yeah. No, they didn't even send them home. They let them in. Or no, I mean, go home, like go home to Banjo Art Station. Yeah. Like yeah. go, go fuck off go to your land. mine some plutonium. Yeah. And also that's another thing is I read also in, uh, I think it was in the paper that there was potentially uranium deposits known in the Banjuan Station acreage area of Australia. I don't think it was potentially. I think there were known uranium known. deposits. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they were clearly going there to try and mine uranium. Yeah. And, and possibly refine it. And and in, also test chemical agents on sheep. And they've got fucking they've got labs with beakers and fucking what do they call the fucking spinner things? I don't know. Um, the spinner things. You know what I'm talking about. We all though. know what you mean. Yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> but like all this fucking scientific gear, they were apparently recruiting like Russian scientists into their fold. Okay, so Hayakawa, the uh, construction minister that you referenced earlier. Yes. Between 1992 and 1995 made 21 different trips to Russia mm. and was there for a total of 180 days over three years. He attempted to, so there was a, a investigation obviously into all of this after uh, the, the Tokyo subway incident. Right. Um, according to that investigation found that he had recruited, <laughs> like, Oh, this all makes so much sense now successfully recruited at least two nuclear scientists in Russia. And one of his notebooks from a, from one of his trips there had an entry in which he wrote, how much is a nuclear warhead? And then had a list of prices below it. Oh, wow. He was just straight up getting quotes on nukes. While in Russia. Fucking Russia is a trip and that had, you can go fucking price check nuclear warheads against competitors. Yes. Oh, this soap is $1.75 at Kmart, but I bet I can get it for $1.65 <laughs> at Walmart. Let's go. Yes. So it doesn't seem that far-fetched that they had either acquired somehow or built somehow a relatively small, but a working nuclear weapon, and they were testing it in an area where the nearest city is 800 miles away. Yeah, dude. That When they came into Perth in September of 93, they had a meeting with what they refer to in this paper as their consulting geologist, which is like, okay, you have a consulting geologist for your cult. Great. Yeah. Uh in, in, and in that meeting, they told that geologist that they wanted to obtain a ship and asked how much it would cost to buy a ship. Wait, what What kind of ship are we talking about? Like an on-the-ocean ship. I know, but... Uh, well, like, they said they wanted to export uranium ore from Banjuwarn Station and 44-gallon drums. So something that could export ore why would, and 44-gallon <laughs> drums. Why would you say that? I don't know. <laughs> I do not know. We're exporting puppies. Don't worry about it. Yeah, like, I kind of feel like that's probably something you should, uh... And yet, not no one had people. any idea they were doing any of this at the time. This True. all came out years later. Right. Right. And only because they managed to kill 13 people in the subway system. Which, honestly, it kind of sounds like you're fucking up by being like, we're just gonna do a little bit of acid over here. So, yeah, that's my... Maybe my biggest and first question about this whole did they build or acquire a nuke thing. If they had, why didn't they use it? If they had a nuke, why were they using like relatively small amounts of nerve agents to kill 13 people? Well, I, so, right. I guess if your goal is literally to bring about Armageddon, and you have a nuclear weapon, it seems like you would be trying to use that nuclear weapon rather than poisoning a dozen people at a time. Well, thousands, but killing a dozen people at a time. Well, and, and, to, the, and to that point, their goal was for that attack to be far more deadly than it was. They thought that based on the volume that they had dispensed in the subway station that they were going to be like 
in, in like the death toll is going to be in the in the thousands. But I don't know if it something actually went wrong or if it just didn't wasn't as potent as they thought or it was evacuated yeah. and cleared. But like that was the what I what I read was maybe more towards the the goal of it. I guess we've told the most of the story at this point, so we can get into and we're also the, like get, getting on time about the end of the episode. Yeah. So, so yes, I agree with you. Like, I don't understand. Okay, I don't understand a handful of things. One, all I've ever been able to to understand about nuclear weaponry is that it's very fucking hard to enrich uranium to the point that it is usable for a nuclear warhead. I have literally zero knowledge about that, but I've also heard that. And to the extent with which there are semi-developed countries who work at it with fairly uh, professional scientific laboratories for years, if not decades, without successfully enriching uranium to the point that it is potent enough for a nuclear weapon. Yes, and some of those countries probably don't have the number of people and the amount of resources dedicated to it that a cult whose only purpose is to acquire money to bring about the end of the world does. True, there is that. And in their case, it may have been some of the same people working on it if they're recruiting Russian nuclear physicists. Also, also a fair point. But I guess the other thing that makes this story tough is that the explosion outside of Banjuan Station happened like six weeks after the first documented entry of the 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 cult into yes into Australia. And I don't think they had actually purchased the property yet, or weren't like living on the site yet. Uh, oh, okay. I'd, I'd read a couple different reports. One said that they had like been to Australia and seen the property. Yep. And then left. And then before they had returned is when this explosion, alleged explosion happened. Yes. So I read at least one report that said they were not even in Australia at the time of this alleged explosion or meteor or whatever the hell it was. Yeah. It's also hard because there's not, there aren't a lot of resources or like a lot of sources yep. from which to pull information. And a lot of it falls again into the category of like one person wrote something. It's not very well sourced. And now there are 3000 articles citing that one unsourced original article. And we don't know if any of this information that's being repeated over and over again is actually true or if it's being embellished by, in this case, uh, what was his name? Harry Mason. Yes. For potentially personal gain. <laughs> right, 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 right. So I'll give you my take on this real quick. Yeah. We, we only have a couple minutes. Yep. I think they definitely were trying to acquire and or build a nuclear weapon. Yes. I think it's possible they succeeded in one or both of those quests. Yes. Um, they certainly had the resources to do so. They certainly were trying to do that. I think that's pretty well documented. Yeah. I don't think that they probably tested one in Australia in 93. Mm. Because if you did, so first of all, you got one probably, right? If you're buying something on the black market, probably don't have a stockpile. No. If you're buying a nuke for millions of dollars or whatever it would be, you're probably getting one and you're probably getting some sort of assurance that it fucking works. Sure. You're probably not going to transport it back to the middle of nowhere in Australia to test it. Yes. And if you did have nuclear weapons available to you, two years later, you probably wouldn't be carrying out relatively compared to a nuclear attack, relatively small chemical attacks. Sure. So I think they were definitely trying to acquire nukes, maybe even succeeded, 
but probably didn't test one in the desert in 93. Alternative take. Yes. We know they, they proved and is documented that they were able to acquire a military, military helicopter from Russia and smuggle it into Japan. And a couple of cult members were received helicopter uh, tr- flight training in the U.S. also. Ooh. Mm-hmm. Bummer. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> so they so, planned to use it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, or maybe had used it. Right. So they're they're well versed in paying for equipment they're not supposed to have and getting it from country to country. Yeah, although their methods seem highly questionable, but apparently they were good enough in the nineties. Slightly harebrained, <laughs> but also you know, they worked. So yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, it's hard to argue with it when you're like, well, you got a fucking helicopter yeah, out of nah, it, didn't you? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> but like, part of me wonders, uh, my, my alternative take is, could you have done the same thing with a nuke out of Russia into Japan, taken it from Russia into Australia, somehow smuggled it or hit it amongst the vast additional number of stuff they're talking about acquiring A bunch ships, of the other shit they didn't care about. Yeah. Right, uh, flying. No, no, they definitely could have. And I'm not ruling out that they ha- even had a nuke in Australia at one point. Yeah, yeah. I don't think if you spend millions of dollars on one, all you do with it is test it out in the middle of nowhere. Well, okay, So, here, but here's my theory. is My theory is they wanted to see what a nuke was like. Like They wanted to be like, let's fucking see what this thing will do. So they went and got one, knowing they got a billion dollars. If it cost, I mean, it, even if it cost them a hundred million dollars, if their whole job is a doomsday cult, they're like, well, fuck it. We got nine more of these we can go buy with our amassed fortune. We know how to make money, obviously, at this point. Right, we know how to make money, and we've got a stockpile. You know, again, I'm not, like, pretending to know how much a fucking nuclear weapon costs on the black market, but, like, yeah. if if it was $100 million... Also, we should note that it was, uh, as far as nukes go, relatively... S- that explosion that was measured would have been from a relatively small nuclear weapon. Right. Uh, I forget what the actual... I think I have the... Nope, I don't have it. Never mind. And, well, and one thing we haven't said, too, is could it have just been a big-ass bomb of some kind? You know, like, sure. could, could they have bought and wanted to see, like, what's this big-ass bomb do? And could they have been in the area or space trying to go, let's blow one up, see what it does on our... And and I know it hadn't been their property at the time, but we're talking about a 1,500-acre plot of land, like... That's so massive, you could drive into that land, blow was, something up, and leave, and no one would have any idea you were there. Also, it was half a million acres. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah. So that's like as It was big- like hundreds of square miles. It was fucking gigantic. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, what I'm saying with 1,500 acres is that's what a station is in Australia. Is anything bigger than a plot of 1,500 yeah, no, no, acres they, is they considered a station. They owned half a million acres. In Western Australia. So maybe they were they already had their eyes on that plot of land and they were already like well, they did already have their eyes on that plot of land. We know we know as much that they had their eyes on it. I mean, that's literally the size of some fucking state parks in or national parks in the United States. Like we're talking huge. I'm trying to get some sort of Okay. That's roughly seven hundred and eighty square miles. Oh my god. That's a pretty big space. That's humongous. That they somehow purchased for four hundred grand. Some might shitty not, land. <laughs> might not be a whole lot there. Yeah, yeah, it might just be a lot of desert. Still. Um, but but yeah, I mean, like, I guess I I could see it as being like, look, we're gonna buy this one way or another. We're just figuring out the details, but we're already here and we've already got some shit here. Let's see what this thing does. While we go, this is going to be the home base where we're going to be fucking blowing shit up every other day once we finally get this uranium enriched. So let's just fucking do it, see what it does, maybe buy some more, maybe build some bombs. Cool, sounds good. And they fucking failed, obviously, at potentially either acquiring more or smuggling more or or building more. Or they just didn't get around to using them. Or they didn't get around to using them. But that, I guess, I don't know, that that to me seems like a, a, a very realistic outcome is that they tried to blow up a big-ass bomb out there and they were like, oh, oh, holy fuck! <laughs> holy <laughs> shit! Hey, that was bigger than we thought! Holy fuck! 
And they're like, all right, we should be careful next time. Uh, so, guys, how's the digging going? Are we we going to have it next time soon? And they're like, fucking, we're going to need you to wait a few years. Yeah. Let's let's see how many sheep we can kill with this nerve agent. Right. And, and the other thing, too, you know, it also kind of reminds me uh, a little bit of, like, when you have that many different sects of a, of a cult and you have people working on different continents and different countries and different groups that there's a distinct possibility that people weren't necessarily working together, which is why I go like, yeah. maybe there were some people in Japan who were like, fuck the subway. And they're like, going to go fucking right. These might not have been totally coordinated. Yeah. yeah. While the other, like, our fucking nuclear division of the government is down right. in Australia when trying to figure their shit out. 100,000 people on four different continents. You're not necessarily coordinated in every every move that you make. Right, which yeah. is which is my, I guess, my counter for if you have this, why would you do this? It's like, well, maybe they're all just like, ah, kill them all. And like, that's right. everyone's task right. and they're doing it with whatever fucked up shitty tools that they, they have at their disposal. One guy was heading up the banana peel division. Yeah. <laughs> oh, they're going to slip so bad, bud. They're going to hit all their heads. It's going to be great. One guy is just facilitating all the old people accidents. God's coming for us. Once all these old people fall over, they're going to break all their hips. We're going to, and God's going to love uh, us for it. This is the worst. We should end this. We out of here. We out of here, y'all. Um, fucking fuck them. Fuck those guys. <laughs> And their shitty, shitty ideas. Let's all try to love each other more. Have a good week. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye, guys.